Uh, we are in the process now of transferring our domain, the hosting and all of that for our website over to a new hosting network because the Assemblies of God are, is no longer providing the free hosting for websites for their churches and ministries. So we're in the process of going to a different hosting company. And it's in that process right now. So hopefully within the next week, if you go out to the website, www.middleriverag.org, if you go there now, you're, you're not gonna find anything. But hopefully within the next week, that will be taken care of. Thank you. But our Facebook page is up and our YouTube channel is working. So check us out. Amen? So exciting. Amen. I just got a notification of somebody sharing something on Facebook. I'm going to put my phone over there. Praise God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he is saying, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. I mean, what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that it has been preserved through these many centuries, Lord God, through time, Lord, that they are still applicable to us today. And we believe, Lord God, that your word is active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So Holy Spirit, we pray that today you would teach us. Activate your word in our lives so that we can be perfectly established in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Many years ago, many of you were here when this happened. I, I was not. But this church went through a split. And it was a pretty hard split. Most of the people that remained here uh, was, was very dedicated to uh, what the Word of God stood for and, and, and the, uh, what the Assemblies of God believed. And the, 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 the division that was made um, almost ruined this church and its work here and its mission here. But praise God, it didn't. Amen. It didn't. The, the devil tried to, to destroy the work that God had planted here. But because of faithful men and women and the faithfulness of God, this church was established, it stayed, and it grows. And we thank the Lord for that. And, and some of us here in this church have had some heart-rending experiences seeing or living through that, uh, that division, through that split, or, or even seeing that happen in other churches. It's heartbreaking. And I, I started with that story to indicate that I, as a, I as a person, or we as people are not unfamiliar with what Paul is really talking about here. Division is the mark of the Corinthian church. Paul here in verse 9 
that, that we closed with verse 9 uh, last week, says that God has called us into the fellowship of his son, Christ Jesus our Lord. Fellowship is koinonia. It's more than just coming together and eating food and going home. Koinonia is about doing the life together. And here was a church where there was, there was no fellowship. There was no meeting of the minds. There was no doing life together. And by the way, divisions not only come among churches. Divisions can come among families, among friends. Divisions can be found anywhere. Look at, look at the United States. Look at our country today. The divisiveness that is in our country today. So the principles that, that, that are applied here by Paul to the healing of broken relationships can be taken by us and can be applied to the broken relationships that we have in our life. Now, if you look at verse 10, verse 10 speaks to us about the qualifications of the person that desires to be a healer, to be one that brings others together. And, and, and Paul here seeks to be that healer in this Corinthian situation. But as he writes in chapter 1, verse 10, here this, this, this letter to the Corinthian church, he begins here with a spirit of conciliation. If you notice, he says, I appeal to you, brothers. I appeal to you, brothers. We must remember that, that Paul has already established that he was an apostle called by Jesus Christ. He was all, he's already established the fact that he has a calling on his life from God. And he could approach this, this whole thing with the authority that he had. It says, I command you. Or, or um, I order you. Or I demand of you. But he comes here with the spirit of conciliation. He says, I appeal to you. I appeal to you. In other words, I'm going to, to, to really just ask you and almost beg you. I appeal to you. He's not coming here with, with this division between people with a spirit of I'm going to knock their heads together and get this thing straightened out. How many of you as parents have ever thought to knock your kids' heads together when things weren't going right? Yes. Yes. And many of us have had other thoughts, like, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. Okay? So, yes, we, but Paul could have came with that. And, and the thing is, when we come with this kind of authority into a, a place of division, in, in a place of problems, in a place of, of no coming together, we come, and we come like that, oftentimes there's, there's this further division, this further problem, this further splitting People get further apart. When we come with this, this spirit of, look at what I'm going to do. I'm going to fix the problems here. And start ordering the uh, people around. The division is not healed. The division is not healed. <coughs> so Paul, even in his authority, came together and said, let's, let's, let's work on this. I appeal to you. And he further indicates this conciliation by calling them brothers. Brothers. Now this further softens the rebuke. It doesn't make it any less poignant. Matter of fact, it might make it more poignant. But it, it, it says brothers. He calls them brothers. He, he could have very well said, brothers and sisters, let's, let's, let's come together. I appeal to you. Let's come together. In this and he does that because in reality how can brothers I mean I mean there's there's always this longing of brothers to be brothers isn't there there's always a family connection no matter what no matter what now I know that there's there's times when brothers can do some things that You'd rather not them do, but there's there's always a bond there. You know, he could have said to them, I appeal to you, you fresh you fleshy Christians. <laughs> we'll get to that later. He 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 kind of uses that term, but he doesn't say 
He's, he doesn't come and say, listen, you stupid people. What are you doing? No. He says, I appeal to you, brothers. You know, walking in a spirit of, of conciliation. And then, I think significantly, too, that in approaching in a, uh, uh, in the division as a healer, he had a clear knowledge of what the Lord wanted to happen. He knows what the Lord's desire for this church was. This isn't always the case that I found when I approached divisions. Sometimes I'm purely concerned about what I want and not what the Lord wants in the situation. Sometimes we come together, look, how many times have we had an argument with somebody and the only way that that, that that thing was going to be resolved is if the other person apologized. The problem is when you talk to the other person, the other person might be going, well, the only way we're going to resolve this is if they apologize. So everybody's looking for the, the, the conciliation on the other end. You've got to come to me, you know. Um, and, and Paul sees that, you know, that doesn't do work very well in, in things all the time. Now, if there's clearly a wrong and there's clearly a right, that's different. If you have wronged somebody, let me go, let me just encourage you to go to that person and say, I apologize for this. If there's a clear right and wrong and you're on the wrong side, now, if you're on the right side, let me tell you what, you may have a little bit more influence into that person's life to correct the wrong if you go to that person in love. See, forgiveness does not depend on the other person. Forgiveness depends upon us. Do we forgive them? See? Just saying. Just a little sidebar there. But here's the thing. It's so easy to become locked into what I want. And, and it's far more difficult to get locked into what Jesus wants. And, and Paul here, he, he appeals to the Corinthians not on the basis of what he wants as an apostle, as the, as the founding one that God used to start this church. Okay? He appeals to the healing of this division on, on what Jesus wants himself. That's why he uses the term, I appeal to you brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. I'm coming to you in, in the authority of Jesus. This is what Jesus wants. When you think of what Jesus wants for this situation, you begin to work on it. There's no other name. There's no other idea or, or name big enough, great enough, glorious enough, or powerful enough to draw everybody together. It's the name of Jesus. Our diversities and differences of background are too great. It's the name that pulls us together is the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So Paul says, being pulled together in the name of Jesus. I want you to agree together. Agree with one another. Now, literally, this reads, I want you all to say the same thing. Woo! I want you all to say the same thing. Wow. Now, commentators have, have had some problems with this, wondering what he meant. All say the same thing. Does this mean he wants us to, to talk alike and, and not have any... Uh, divergencies or any kind of different ideas or probably this phrase in verse 12 or that we find in later verse 12 uh, this phrase I want you all to say the same thing refers to what people were saying as, as, as Paul mentioned in verse 12 he says, some were saying that I am of Paul I am of Apollos I am of Cephas and I'm of Christ they were saying different things in the Corinthian church about the, the source of their identity. Paul says, you need to put away these differences and start saying the same thing. What happens here is that Paul is admonishing us not to put our, our slot 
in the body of Christ in preeminence over our commitment to Jesus Christ. Don't put your slot. Well, I, I, I'll share with you what I mean by that in, in, a, in a little bit here, in a few seconds. But don't put your slot ahead of Jesus Christ Himself. It's so easy for us to do that. I mean, there are those who identify themselves. They, they say these phrases like, I'm Pentecostal. Others will find their, 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 their identity in, in I'm, I'm apostolic. Or, you know, um, I'm traditional. Or I'm contemporary. I'm spirit-led. Or I'm liturgical. There are those who say, I am King James Version, and others say, I'm NIV, or I'm Revised Standard Version. They're all, they're, make a, they're making a point of division on the basis of what Bible or version they go to. Some will say, I am of Clyde Oliver. Others will say, I am of Bruce Craig. Others will say, I am of John LeCount. And others will say, I am of Mike Powis. Former pastors here. And the current pastor, by the way. <laughs> Hope for, hopefully for a while. But anyway, some will say, I am Baptist. Or I'm Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Or I'm Lutheran. Or I'm Assembly of God. I actually talked to a guy yesterday. Invited him to church. And he goes, I go down the street. I said, oh, you go to Our Lady Queen of Peace? He goes, yes. I said, that's okay. You're welcome here. We love to have Catholic people here. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen? Yeah. Some say I'm independent or I'm non-denominational or I'm interdenominational. Come on now. Paul says, you all say the same thing. And what's the same thing that we should say? I am of Christ. This is our common confession. As to the different organizations of the body of Christ to which we belong, these are just simply means of expressing the diversity of the body of Christ. Now see, there's a distinct division between, there's a distinct difference, I should say, between division and diversity. Paul will encourage the Corinthians later to express their diversity. Diversity is a good thing. Division is a bad thing. We'll come to that in 1 Corinthians 12. From time to time, people say, what kind of church you go to? And I used to, used to sit there saying, I go to an Assemblies of God church. And they kind of look at me weird. Pentecostal. Kind of look at me weird. Now they will go all the way back to Protestant. Okay? It's like, what do you mean? We're not Catholic. So it's like, it's like you know, here's the thing, and, and this is the way that I'm, I'm, I'm learning to answer that question. My response, we are a Christian church. We're a Christian church. Not denominally, denominationally as such, but a Christian church in the broadest sense, in the generic sense. It's where Christians, regardless of their background or whatever we, we're called to be together in Christ. We are Christians, meant to be Christians, meant to associate with, with those who name the name of Christ. One of the things that Paul sees as an end result is to bring people into saying the same thing. He says, there should not be any divisions among you. It's this word picture that, that signifies a garment that is ripped, that's torn. You shouldn't be torn apart. It, uh, that is, they, they shouldn't, they shouldn't, and, and I, on the outwardly, from being outside the church, people saw them as one church. On the inside, they had all these little rips, all these tears, all these divisions. Specifically, four major ones. But um, what wasn't happening is they didn't say, okay, well, we're going to go start the first Corinthian church 
the first Corinthian church of, you know, Broad Street or the first Corinthian church of, of Main Street, the first Corinthians church of, you know, they, they weren't doing that. From the outside, they were one church, but the inside, they were fraying apart. Okay, and Paul says, I want you to be perfectly united in mind and in thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. This word perfectly united, at its roots, it has the idea of restoration. It means to be put in order, to restore, to restore to the former condition. There are three times that this word is used in the New Testament. The first time it's used is, is James and John in, in the Gospels. They're mending their nets. It's the same word for mending. Okay? And, and that's the word Paul uses here. Perfectly united. It's the same word in the Gospels where Peter and John are mending their nets. Once again, mending. Perfectly united. Now, to mend a net meant that you, you had to clean the net from the previous catch. Get all the other stuff out of it, you know. When, when, you, when you have a, a net out into the, the, the water and there's fish to go into it, you catch fish. You know you don't only catch fish, right? You catch other things, you know. And, and so to mend the net, you have to put it back into its former condition, ready to be used again. You mend the net. You clean it. You repair any spots that, that might be broken. You fold it up neatly in the boat. So that way when you go to cast it out, you're not untangling the, the net, you know? It's mended. It's put back into its former condition. That way every time you go to use it, it's ready. Right? Okay. And that's what they're saying. Uh, that's what he was saying. You get back to where, there, where you were before there was divisions. I would say that this is a tremendous model of divisions that may occur between believers or friends or, or family. The Lord does not want us to be in a state of civil war. He doesn't want us to be uh, in a state of declared truce either. You know, kind of like that, what, what's going on between North and South Korea right now. There's this, there's this, God does not want there to be that kind of thing in our life. When at any time that truce could be shattered. No, he wants it to be put back the way it was before the division. And that's how he wants us as, church, as a church to be. That's how he wants us as Christians to be. That's how he wants his, the body of Christ to be. No divisions. Restored, put back and knit together. Now some have the viewpoint that you can't unscramble an egg. You know, once you scramble an egg, once you break out, you're the... There's no way to get that yoke back the way it was. Now that's true as it pertains to an egg, but Paul changes the situation as it pertains to human relationships. He's talking to us here very clearly in respect to division and restoration. The restoration is occurring when we have the mind and judgment of Jesus. He says that you be united in mind and thought. How is that accomplished? That's accomplished by putting on the mind of Christ. As in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. That mind that comes through humble servanthood. The Lord wants our divisions put away and he wants us to find ourselves back in relationship as that division had never occurred. Now let me say this. It's always a humbling thing to go back in relationship before something happened. You have to be humble. You can't come across and think, I won. Or, I'm winning. See, the healer here has this sort of temperament and character. He or she approaches with gentleness and humility and has the goal of seeing a perfect healing take place in the relationship. Verses 10 through 12 talk about diagnosing correctly the source of this division. 
How many times have, have there been a, a false conclusions or maybe haven't, did, haven't had all the facts right or, or you know, and, and then a bigger mess was created before we got into it? It's always possible to reach wrong conclusions, isn't it? Always. We hear what we want to hear. And it's just not God's. We all hear what we want to hear. I thought I'd get a little bit more chuckle out of this. Or maybe it's just me. You only hear what, what you want to hear. But that's how we all are. A lot of times hearing rumors can be, uh, can be wonderfully delectable. It's just a delight sometimes to hear rumors. Peaks our interest, makes our mouth water. Tell me more. We hear what we want to hear. And Paul in verse 11 says, Certain people from Chloe's household have informed me. Now, this is not like Chloe's household said that somebody said that this said, was said and that this happened. No. No, Paul's saying here that because the word informed has the meaning of, of it would be something like this. People from Chloe's household have made it perfectly clear. Now, Chloe was a woman of, of means, evidently, because she, she, her household, probably her employees, came to Ephesus, and they brought Paul, not some anonymous tip, not an anonymous letter, not some rumors, but signed on the dotted line, they have identified who they were, and what the problem was. Paul knew the names of the people who were causing this problem and the other problems in the church. Oftentimes, we never get to our problems if we just go by remote control. I never do anything on the basis of an anonymous letter. And yes, there have been times when I've been told things anonymously. <laughs> if I can't talk to the person about it, and they're accusing somebody of something else, and they don't have the guts to put their name on the dotted line and say, this is from me. That's just a rumor. I, I, if I'm going to have to do something, I want to have an accurate information. And Paul says, I've waited for the information to be accurate. And when he has discerned that he has the right source of the problem, he looks at the problem in verse 12. <clears throat> On the surface, he sees that these, Chloe, that, that these Chloe people have brought him this report that the Corinthian church, he says, basically, you are in the biggest problem, well, one of the biggest problems here is you are in four different camps. Some of you say, I am of Paul. Now, we don't know exactly what these various camps or parties believe, but they were probably all united. They, they were probably all united under the essentials of faith. Okay? Um, and had to, and what, they, what, what their divisions were, were probably had to do with particular Christian customs and practices and likes and dislikes. And, and that's what they were dividing over. Probably these, these people that were associating with Paul were those who had been converted and identified themselves as founders of the church. Paul founded the church. He went there and he founded the church. The people that had been there the longest. They were probably Gentile believers. They were probably very systematic Bible study lovers. Because that's what Paul did. Paul was very systematic in his Bible study and his, his Bible explanation. And then they had the Apollos party. Apollos was a preacher that followed Paul. He had been identified in the book of Acts as being from Alexandria. Now he was probably eloquent and well versed in scripture. And, and we can tell that because in Alexandria, there was an Alexandrian school of Christianity. Now, that was established 
after this, but these were the type of people who had a rich allegorical interpretation of the Old Testament. They were the ones that could read between the lines. You know, the ones that could put things together that you go, how in the world did you get that? You know, for instance, for an example, second century Alexandria uh, Christianity, there's, there's this, it's called the Epistle, Epistle of Barnabas that argues from Genesis chapter 14, 14, that since Abraham had a household of 318 people, this verse prophesies the crucifixion of Christ. Now, how they arrive at this is that 318 in the Greek numbers are signified by the letters of the alphabet. So they take the numbers, the Greek, the, the uh, Greek alphabet, uh, or Greek numbers, and they whatever, and they, they modeled the, the Alexandrian school modeled in the Epistle of Barnabas would say. By the way, the Epistle of Barnabas is not a canonical; it's not a book of the Bible. It's just a letter from Barnabas. Okay, but they would say that Jesus, because of this, Jesus is crucified prophesied as being crucified in the number 300, 318, which is the number of Abraham's household. Now you see how that all, we have a lot of people that like to study the Bible like this. Okay? The numbers in the Bible mean certain things. And that's what Apollos and his, his, his kind of preaching was. Now, you can go back to the Old, Old Testament and you can find scriptures that prophesy about the crucifixion of Jesus. And uh, you don't have to get that deep into it. I mean, there, in Genesis, there is specifically words that speak about, you know, somebody that's going to come and crush the head of the serpent and that serpent is going to bruise his heel. So, you know, those type of things. But there's, there's people that find the significance in the color of every twine in the tabernacle and how they were layered and, and all of that stuff. And they, 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 it's really interesting. And if you're, if you're into those kind of things, you can just, these people make the scriptures come alive in a different way. And Apollo seemed to be this, this kind of person. And could you imagine a letter to Paul from his supporters, they have said to him, Dear Paul, we miss you. We miss you and your excellent leadership. Things will never be the same without you. This new preacher, Apollos, he's a good speaker, but his sermons, they seem superficial compared to yours. Now, Paul, you know, some preachers might take comfort in the fact of something like that, but Paul wasn't that kind of person. Or could you imagine a letter to Apollos from his supporters? We're glad, we sure are glad you came, Apollos. Paul was a good man to get the church started, but he never was much of a preacher. <laughs> Paul would admit to that. Paul said that he would come in fear and trembling, literally trembling, as he spoke in front of him. And then the third party was Cephas, otherwise known as Peter. They were probably the legalists. They found their identi identity in clutching to what they thought was the Jewishness of Paul, or of, um, of Peter, excuse me. Now, Peter wouldn't have identified with that group. Now, Paul wouldn't have identified with his group either. Or, and Apollos probably wouldn't have identified with that group. But people sometimes define their status in Christ as the length of one's hair or sleeves or skirt or open toe shoe, no makeup, whether they wear jewelry or not. And the, 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 the Cephas party was legalistically oriented like this. And then we come to the Christ party. He's, here, here are the people, and, and, and 
Hear me out here. He, these were the people that says, we don't belong to any man. We belong to Christ. Now, practically every grouping of Christians has within it some potential of some sort of movement to say, we're the spiritual ones. If you really want to know what being spiritual is, you look at our group. We're the, the, the ones that we don't follow any man. We listen directly to Christ. And Paul identifies these as superficial, superficial problems. I belong to Paul, Apollos, or Cephas, or Christ. In reading the text, there's no real reason for division. Paul very precisely states the problem. The problem is not with Paul, it's not with Cephas, it's not with Christ, it's not with Apollos. It was ego. Ego. Ego leads to strife or quarrels. It's characteristic. If you look at, at, at Romans chapter 1, verse 29, that's being egocentric is part of the old life. Before we were found in Christ. In Galatians chapter Chapter 20 is looked at as the work of the flesh. The problem with the Corinthians believers is that they were a bunch of ego-centered rather than Christ-centered people. Carl Sandburg tells the story of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham, uh, of one of Abraham Lincoln's neighbors, excuse me. They saw Abraham Lincoln with two, two small, his two little small sons heading down the streets, and they were bawling loudly. Abraham Lincoln's were, kids were like, they were bawling. And the neighbor asked, what's the matter? And Lincoln answered, just what's the matter with the whole world? I've got three walnuts and each one's two. See, Lincoln saw in the actions of his small sons mirrored the selfishness and strife that plagues the world. Ego. What I want. It's all about me. What do I want? That's the biggest problem. It's one of the biggest problems that we as human beings have. But Paul says, what's the remedy of all of this? First of all, is to rethink Christ. He asks, is Christ divided? Has Christ been divided? Has Christ been parceled out? And how has he become the property of one group? Is Christ the property of the Pentecostals? Is, the, is, is Christ the property of the liturgical? Is he the property of the, the, the Reformed Christians? Is he the property of the Apostolics? Is he the property of the Presbyterians or the Baptists or the Assemblies of God? No. Christ cannot be divided. He can't be parceled out to any one particular group. The real fault of these parties, especially the Christ party here, is not in saying they belong to Christ, but, but in acting as if Christ belonged to them. See, no one group, no one organization, no one church can... Give us the whole of Jesus Christ. We have to rethink the matter of Christian pride. C.S. Lewis identifies it as the most deadly vice. It's here in the correct... It's, it's here. The correct answer to this is Christ divided. Because if we fail to ponder... Paul's questions at times, we can sit back and we can become very much in the flesh. Proud of a certain association that we have or the church or the fellowship that we belong to. It's not a question of we're the best. It's the question that at the cross of Jesus Christ, we found grace. We who are not worthy, have been made worthy by the blood of Christ. You've heard me say it time and time again here. 
I don't say it as much, but I should. It's not about Mike Powers. It's not about Middle River Assemblies of God. It's not even about the Assemblies of God. It's about the body of Christ. Paul says, rethink Christ. Christ hasn't been handed out and become the property of any one group. He tells these, these Corinthians, not only do you need to rethink Christ, you need to rethink me. You need to rethink Paul. Has Paul been crucified for you? Paul, through this question, is saying, no preacher can be crucified for you. No preacher can forgive your sins. No preacher can heal or hurt or supply the power you need. This only comes from Jesus Christ. All I can do is be a conduit of what the Lord wants. I have no power to save you. I have no power to heal you. I have no power to speak to your inner man. That comes from Christ. Paul then tells the, the, the Corinthians 2 to rethink baptism. You were, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now some here have, have falsely accused Paul of belittling baptism. He's not belittling baptism of all, at all. He's simply indicating that he's glad that no act of his can be misconstrued as annexing people to himself rather than Christ. He says, you are baptized into Christ. Notice the phrase there, into Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 1.13. What does this mean? If I put money in your bank account, that money is yours. It's at your total disposal. It's yours to use of you as you will. It's been put into your account. When we have been baptized into Christ, we have been placed under his complete control. The outer baptism which we experience simply expresses the inward reality that has already been accomplished in salvation. And evidently, there may have been some in the, in the Corinthian congregation who were making a big deal of who they were baptized by. Paul says it doesn't matter who baptized you. It's who you're baptized into. Still have churches like that. Even today we deal with things like this. And so because of ego. Of ego. Ego is always at the root of the problem in broken relationships. If these relationships are to be healed, we must find ourselves submitting to Jesus Christ. This is the same conduct with Paul that Paul had exemplified when he came to Corinth. He didn't come to Corinth with the standpoint of, what I can do, look what I can do, how smart I am, how well I can preach, how good of an organizer I am. Look, I'm a church growth expert. He could have come in there and said, I've had experience all over the world, and now I've come to Corinth to bless you with my presence. But that wasn't him at all. To do that would have emptied the, the cross of its power. And there are many ways in which we can empty the cross. It's the cross of Jesus that, that saves us. It's not the ingenuity of some human effort. Paul says, I don't dare rob the cross of Jesus Christ of its power by pretending that I was the person who saved you. That I was the person who should be your leader. Paul's, Paul's saying, my sole function is to be, if you will, like John the Baptist. And this is my prayer for me. I always want to have this attitude. John the Baptist said that he, meaning Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. We must be careful lest we rob the cross of Christ Jesus of its power and make it vain through our self-effort. 
And as we come to the end of this, I want you to look into your life. I want you to look into your heart. And, and, and see, are there any divisions in your life? Now, you may say, no, there's, there's, as I look around, there's none. That's a great testimony. Praise God for that. But take a deep look on a personal, individual, and even maybe a family level. If this word has come to you this morning, and you've had to say, yeah, there's some division. I have division with my spouse, or I have division with my kids. There are, I have a division. There's something that's in between me and some friends or persons in the, in the body of Christ. The Lord wants you to look at this this morning and look at your, first of all, look at your ego. From a standpoint of humanity, of humanity as did Christ, taking a towel Jesus, the Bible describes us, that tells us that Jesus sustains all things. But what did he do? He took a towel and he washed the feet of his disciples. Here, God the Son, not only did he lower himself to become human and grow up, as a human, he lowers himself to, be, to become a servant. Humility. See, we need to believe with Christ that the breach, that that division can not only be repaired in a loose sort of way, but it can be restored so that it will be as though the division never took place. How can I say this biblically? That's exactly the reason why Jesus came to earth. The division that is between humans and God, man and God, caused by the first man, Adam. God wants to reconcile us to himself. So he provided the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Not so that we can be, have some, just be here on earth and him in heaven and we pray you know, whatever and then he heals us, and, you know, or, or he gives us peace. That's, that's not what salvation is about. Being saved is a is, is, is about a relationship with God the Father being restored ultimately to the place where we come to a new heaven and a new earth. See, we are saved by grace. Okay? We are saved because of the power of, of what Jesus did on the cross. Not anything that we can do, not anything that we did. Let's get ego out of the way. Let's get what I did out of the way. I didn't do anything except for sin. God did everything to rebuild that relationship. See, and, and, and that's what Paul's saying here. The church needs to be reconciled as one, as if the division never occurred. Never occurred. I don't want to rob in my life the cross of Christ and his power. I'm not going to be able to stand before God and say, you know, I was pretty good this week. I've done well this week. I was a model citizen and I was a credit to your kingdom this week. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, as a personal testimony or of a, of a, oh, I shouldn't say a personal testimony, but as a, an expression of moral and ethical behavior, that's good. But that isn't what saves you. That comes short. 
It's the cross of Christ. It's the cross of Christ that saves us. Not how good we are. We can never take the stance of boasting of how good we are lest we strip the power away from the cross of Jesus Christ. It's He that has made us good. Him. He's the one that has made us free. The cross of Christ on us. You see, that's Paul, Paul's saying. Be one. Be united. Come together as one in Christ. Let there be no divisions among you. Say the same thing. Live it out like that. And that's what he wants us to do in our personal relationships too. Amen? So let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we just want to give you thanks this morning. You are great. You are greatly to be praised. You are worthy of all praise and honor and glory this morning. And we thank you, Lord God, that you love us. And that you have healed the broken fellowship between, you have healed the broken fellowship between yourself and us. You took the initiative in healing what, could, what we could not heal ourselves. You bridged the, the chasm, the distance that lay between you and me. And you brought us to yourself. You reconciled us unto yourself in Christ Jesus. And because we are reconciled, we have been reconciled to you. You, Lord God, command us to be reconciled to one another. So that we hear, we hear your appeal today. And Lord, we respond to it. And we give you thanks. Hallelujah. Everyone's still praying. Have you been reconciled with Christ? Are you trying to work your way to heaven? Oh, pastor, I do the right things. I do right when I can. I give money to the church. And I do this and I do that. Have you put your faith in the cross? All these things are good. Doing the right thing is great. We should worship God in giving to him. But God doesn't want your money more than he wants your life. He wants your love. He wants you. And that's what the cross is all about. Jesus gave up his life so that we can in turn trust him and give him ours. If that's you this morning, you want to make that commitment to him, you just raise your hand. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, just let us know if you make that decision. You can put a comment. You can email us. We're there for you. But let's pray this prayer. Let's pray this prayer together this morning. Amen. Let's pray it. Thinking back, if you're saved, think back as you say this. The first time you said a prayer like this, that you, you know, what God did in your life. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you. A sinner. I need your grace. I need your mercy. And I need your love. I accept the work of the cross and what Jesus did when he died. I ask for forgiveness and put my hope and faith in you. You 
gave your life for me. Now I give my life to you. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Isn't it good to, to know that we can have that security in Jesus Christ? Amen. That God reconciled himself to us. He came to earth so that we could be in right relationship with him. Wonderful news. Amen. Let's stand as we're dismissed this morning.